Hi, and welcome to this coronavirus freight market update on April 7th, 2020. Welcome. And we have an action-packed show for you today. Basically, we'll go through the news headlines and then off to a couple of really great interviews. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, we, we a bi-weekly show. So self-quarantine people, call in, give us your comments, ask us questions. Yes. Who LinkedIn, does, who YouTube, does your hair? Facebook. Basically, I'll be checking LinkedIn through through this segment. So Yeah. So shoot us any questions that you have. This is really for for everyone who's locked indoors in their houses, remote working, and want to get all the latest news and information of how coronavirus is impacting the freight markets. Right, Vincent? That's right. I'm Mike Vincent, and you're Kevin Hill. Uh, that's right. So I am Kevin it. Hill. How so, about by the numbers? I hate yeah, this let's part. Do by the numbers. I hate this part. I can't yeah, wait until they're right? really good news, but let's go through the numbers, bro. So on Thursday, when we did this, uh, on Thursday, the uh, U.S. coronavirus case count was at 215,003. And uh, we still lead the world at uh, 367,719, which I think is 369,069 at this moment, as reported. Uh, deaths were at 5,100, and now we're at 11 and 11,018 at this particular moment. So, and when we started the very first show, we're at 6,300 cases and 110 deaths. Kevin, yeah, so, so uh, we, we doubled since Thursday on on the, the death count, unfortunately. We did, and unfortunately. And uh, so looking at uh, the IHME, which the, is the Institute for Health and Evaluation at uh, University of Washington, uh, they have a really cool site uh, they, they with projection models. And so they're saying that we're about eight days from the peak, and they're looking at uh 3,130 deaths per day uh, mm -hmm. on that peak date in, in eight days. Uh, and the total deaths uh, modeled out, which would be somewhere about uh, March 18th, 19th, is where it starts to really just plain just... You mean April? No, I mean, I'm going out further now. Through April into March, so April will still keep May. climbing. Uh, so yeah, into May. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Into into May. So May 18th, May 19th would somewhere be or be around 81,000 uh, deaths. Oh, on the okay. Right. So through August, 81,766. Yeah. Now the interesting thing and the thing we all need to keep in mind is that that's the center, right? It's like the center track of the hurricane, and then you've got this cone of uncertainty. So the ranges of deaths per day, even at that 3,100 per day, is from 1,000 to 8,000. Is the, is the is the variance that it, mm -hmm. it could that they're seeing it could go and the total deaths is between fifty thousand and one hundred and forty thousand. Yeah, and the, there's a lot of factors that go into that that variability, but one of the major ones is uh, human behavior. Right? And, and, I mean, yeah, exactly right, and, that, and that's the point. Yeah. Yeah, do what we we'll do. What we need to do, like uh, stay indoors. Yeah, or, or stay. Yeah, the social distancing. Don't think of it as a request. It's a mandate. We need to do it. We need to stay smart. There's signs that it's working. Keep doing it. And so to keep those numbers, and let's keep, let's even stay be un underneath yeah, that 3,100. We brought the peaks down from, from certainly uh, where they could have been if there yeah. was a social distancing, stay at home orders and policies. And you can really see that out, out in California and Washington. Yeah. How, how well they've, they've been able to control the, the claims, uh, hospitalizations, or yeah. cases, hospitalizations, and, and deaths compared to, uh, to the East Coast. Yeah, because I mean, if you remember, um, if you remember, it was it was what a hundred thousand to two hundred forty thousand yeah. was was the range, and so that's come down quite a bit. So, one thing that I wanted to show here, and if we can bring my screen up for everybody else, I know we can't see it behind us, uh, but is is that within you know in in Sonar and certainly through all our different uh, shows and media outlet, we bring you the latest updates that we can on all the information and data. So within Sonar, if you're looking at this, let me pull up our critical events uh, widget. Uh, if I can do this here real quickly, should have had it pulled up already. But let me pull this over here and gain some real estate here so you can see this. So in our critical events, you know, we're tracking all the weather and geological and so on. So now we have a coronavirus layer. <clears throat> and so you can see the hot spots and the trends that are going on now. I have uh, some watchtower advisories on this, so let me get rid of those and kind of clean this up. I've got tropical cyclones, et cetera, and bring this down to uh, just, um, if 
I turn this to off. There we go. So now it's just coronavirus. So what we have in here is this layer, and it's throughout the world. Let me drag this over a little bit is here. Is that county by county? So it's showing actual down to the cities, right? So it gives you the state. So if you're looking at uh, where are we at here? Uh, so let's go to uh, Chattanooga, where we are. So if you're looking here, like, for instance, in Chattanooga, it gives you your uh, state-level testing data, uh, and mm -hmm. it gives you your current uh, cases confirmed and deaths confirmed inside there. And so you can drill down, or you can go to country-level. Uh, as, you, as you drill out, it will start giving you the country-level, et cetera. So you can see the total cases in the United States, deaths, and you can and do this around the country, and you can drill in and see what's going on in, in different locations. So that's a new added feature that we have. Very good. So let's start off with the program. We have a great lineup of guests today. We're going to start with the news with, with Andrew Cox over here in just a second. Uh, but we also have Zach Strickland coming up talking about trucking, Anthony Smith talking about economics, and then we have Trent Broberg, COO of Truck Stop, that will Skype in followed by David Jackson, who's the president and CEO of Knight Transportation. And then we'll talk about what's coming up this week and, and basically uh, on Freight Waves TV. So Excellent. let's start with the news. And the first news story we have is from John Kingston. And he's writing today about insurance. And, you know, insurance and trucking has, you know, we've seen insurance costs a spike over the last 12 12, 18, 24 months, and basically there, there are clauses, kind of like a force majeure clause. Uh, it's called a business inter interruption clause. So we'll okay. let Andrew uh, take it from there. Yep. So John Kingston wrote about, uh, about insurance. As you said, insurance has been a source of animosity in the trucking industry for the last few years because of the rates just continuing to skyrocket. I see a point of contention that, that will be happening and will play out over the next year. Again, a lot of these trucking companies are having their businesses dramatically interrupted. Their, uh, their revenues are down uh, you know, materially over the last couple of weeks and will continue to be down. So some of, the, some of the transportation companies are thinking, what can they do? What, uh, what safety nets do they have in place? So they look towards insurance as maybe one of those safety nets. And a lot of those conversations are beginning to open up between carriers and their insurance providers about the business interruption clause. Uh, we actually spoke to, or we, we listened in on a, on a webinar, rather, uh, from Matt Ragey, the vice president of operations at True North Companies. Uh, and he basically said that it's too early to tell. A time will tell whether or not uh, any insurance players will step up and, and provide some sort of relief. But right now, we don't know. Uh, but my hunch is that it's going to be a point of contention for many months to come. And That's Tom it. Smiley on, on the coronavirus, I, I just want to jump yeah, in please. to read the comments. Uh, it's, he said it's numbing to see. Tom Smiley did. The, and, the numbers. Yeah, the, the numbers, yeah. right? So, so it definitely crazy. is. It kind of goes back to... So, uh, so, Andrew, what does it mean that we'll, it's, too early to, or, or it's too early to tell and we'll see? Is that, is that, are they waiting for people to, for court cases to settle this? Or, or are they, like, magnanimously going to say, oh, well, we'll cover it because it's, it's a bad deal? It could be that. I also think they're they're going to use the insurance companies are going to use uh, basically like a. a a timeout uh, from this to see how bad things get for trucking companies before they make a decision whether they're going to uh, lend relief. In my own personal opinion, the way that trucking uh, companies and insurance providers have battled over the years, I can't see uh, any any scenario in which insurance companies step up to the plate and provide you know at least uh, support across the board. They may provide support in very niche um, in niche requirements, such as somebody that moves automobiles only. I mean that industry is completely shut down near cancellation. Uh, so maybe in some of those very niche niche situations, but I don't see it happening across the board. I think they're using this time to just say, hey, we're not sure right now, but likely we're not going to. Very good. What's our next headline, Michael? Yeah, so uh, our next uh, from Eric Coolish reports, the pandemic forces Boeing, Airbus, and Airbus to shut down aircraft uh, plants. So aircraft manufacturer Boeing uh, and Airbus are suspending production at more assembly plants to protect workers from the novel coronavirus. Uh, that has affected more than 1.3 million people. So Boeing waited much longer to close its South Carolina, uh, Carolina plant uh, than the Washington ones, but that was mostly due to the state's regulations, is, is what I'm reading inside there. And Airbus has also uh, closed more facilities while others continue to operate. Uh, now, interestingly, inside that was 
I, I believe, Andrew, that they were, uh, Boeing was going to pay 10, 10 weeks or, or uh, 10 days of, of, uh, of uh, sick pay. Is that right? Uh, I believe that is right. They're doing their best to, to take care of their employees. I mean, these are two of the biggest uh, manufacturers in, in the world. They have uh, thousands and thousands of employees. We've already seen GM shut down their air jet um, their air jet unit laid off 22 or 2,500 people. I believe that was last week. So these these companies are doing their best. Uh, we'll see how this plays out. This, they'll likely have more shutdowns to come. Boeing still has a couple factories that are still up and running, as does Airbus. But I think all of them will eventually be uh, winding down in the coming weeks. Now it also said that uh, Airbus is utilizing its own uh, aircraft and purchasing masks and and uh, moving those and 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 donating those around the world in several several different locations. Uh, are there others doing that sa the same thing, Andrew? Are you you hearing any of that? Uh, other airline companies, yeah. I haven't heard of specifically, but I mean, there's many companies that are either. Uh, we're we're going to speak here in a little bit about Cummins, how they have um, trying to repurpose some of their materials to try to make masks and provide uh, PPE gear for many of the workers. There's many companies that are flying things from other overseas. Uh, we've seen Tesla that have that have bought uh, some some sort of ventilators and, and donated a thousand of those last week. They've now transformed their factory to try to build ventilators out of uh, more or less car parts. We've seen many other companies that are partnering to do so. So uh, I'm sure the airlines are taking part as well. Yeah, it's really good to see, yeah. Kevin. Yeah, very good. And let's talk a little bit about Amazon. Linda Baker has a story out right now about 30 third-party sellers and expanding that that list of high priority uh, high priority goods uh, for fulfillment warehouses. Can you add a little bit more color on that, Andrew? Sure, a lot of the Amazon third-party uh, sellers on there have been kind of stuck in limbo for the last few weeks because Amazon decided to, uh, to, to kind of limit their Amazon fulfillment only to essential items. So those selling non-essential items have kind of been stuck, and what they've had to do is look at non-Amazon provided alternatives to get their goods distributed, and that's much more expensive for them. Uh, but at this point, third-party sellers are looking to do anything that they can to get their goods moved. They've seen uh, revenues and, and demand drop something like 80% for a lot of goods because that prime delivery that they once uh, relied on is no longer available to them. They're looking at things that take a month or six weeks to deliver through the Amazon fulfillment. So they're looking for other options. But the good news is Amazon is beginning to uh, expand that list of essential items to include some of these people. Very good. Yeah, we have a reader comment, basically, or a viewer comment, not a reader comment, but Rajat from uh, Freight Broker Road Transportation. Uh, and this is a question for, for both you, you know, Andrew and, and Michael Vincent over here. Do you see a nationwide lockdown considered? What do you I, think? Well, uh, my personal opinion is I, I don't see one coming. I, I think is is, and uh, the president in the White House has said that they're they're not really don't want to do that, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, personally, I think if we all keep doing what we're doing right now, it seems to be effect, uh, taking making good effects on mm -hmm. it, right? As has been reported. Uh, and, and as those jump on board, I keep, you know, I hear uh, of, of places around around the United States where there is no lockdown yet because, you know, well, we're just not that affected. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you will be. It's the wave. The wave is coming. So lockdown now. And I think as people a a adhere to that call and see the lockdown as not a request, but as a mandate, do it now, then you won't have to have that, I guess, kind of almost martial law type of dick, you know, yeah. edict. OK, Very Andrew, good. what are your thoughts? I think they've been considering it for many for many weeks now. I don't think they're actually going to do it on a federal level. I believe that they're leaving that decision up to the states. And uh, so far, we've seen some states react well. Some states react, you know, too late and poorly. Uh, I mean, states are learning from their mistakes here. But I think that is something that might be better left to the states. Very good, Andrew. And thank you for the news headlines. Uh, been very informative, and you can go to FreightWaves.com to, to, to get all the news and information on the freight markets during this pandemic and, and after as well. Our next guest will be up in, in just a second. That's Zach Strickland, and he'll be talking about trucking. And I have a, a viewer question here to start you off with, Zach. And that is, and it just jumped on me here, uh, what does the long-term big picture look like for carriers? And then what will the new normal be for us all? But let's just stick with that first, first side of that question right now. What is the long-term 
big picture look like for carriers, and that's from uh, Clay Longwith. He's a national account manager at Direct, I believe that's Direct Transportation. So the, the long range outlook, obviously that's a little bit of a relative term, so I'll, I'll kind of break it down in, in sections. Uh, long range could be a year, could be two years, et cetera. That's gonna have a totally different uh, answer than say say three to six months, which in some people's minds could be a, a long term uh, impact. I think we'll just work our way through that. So the next one to two months, obviously the near term is gonna be pretty brutal. I think that uh, you know volumes are on a rapid pace. They've accelerated uh, downward uh, faster than I anticipated. I, I lost a bet with Craig Fuller just how, how fast those volumes would drop. I believe we're, we're not to that date yet, but uh, our outbound tender volume index is accelerating towards that 9,000 limit, uh, which would be roughly 10% lower uh, than the base value of, of where it started on March 1st, 2018 um, by April 15th. Again, this is extremely unseasonably low for this time of year. Uh, if you're looking at last year, we bottomed out around 9,300 on a non-holiday uh, you know, type level uh, in mid-May. This is after the Chinese New Year, tra I mean the trade war with uh, China and all that kind of stuff was popping off and volumes just plummeted um, in mid-May. So we're looking at volumes potentially bottoming out 20 to 30 percent lower year over year over the next couple of months. Uh, again, that number depends dramatically on just how far we're, you know, how long we're locked down, uh, how long, you know, the economy stays subdued, uh, people not in work. So that, that could have, you know, a even a deeper impact than we're anticipating. So, But I think that here in the next three months or so, we should start to see things starting to pick back up, come online. Carriers are obviously going to have to be able to, uh, you know, adapt and to these lower volumes for a, a several months here to make it through to the other side as effectively as they can. Uh, the quicker that they can adapt to the uptick in volumes and everybody coming back online, the better off they'll be. Uh, six months from now, I think we'll you know, we'll start to see things really returning to normal, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, depending on what they're saying with the coronavirus uh, outbreak and how it's mitigated here in the near term. Uh, so CARES will have to be ready to go at that point in time because I do think that things will start to really ramp back up significantly here towards July, August, and September. And then in a year from now, I really think that things will be, you know, will be in full on recovery mode at that point. Hopefully the virus doesn't have a resurgence over winter with any significance. Uh, but again, if all remains on track as it is today, we're gonna see this big dip for the next couple of months. Come out on the other side in third quarter, fourth quarter should be back to somewhat of a trending up to seasonality. Zach, do you think that's a more, what camp are you in? More of a V-shaped recovery or, uh, a U shape or somewhere in between? Uh, you know, to me, this looks more like a U shape. I don't, you know, I didn't, it's more like a V shaped or an upside down V shaped, uh, you know, drop. But I think we'll see more like a U shaped recovery just because when we're watching this, uh, you know, outbreak really kick off in early March, you saw more of a steady level uh, curve on the front end as things were kind of ramping back up. This is a little bit, you know, even though it was a pretty quick uh, reaction by the market uh, itself to all the panic buying, it's still a lot smoother than it is on the downturn. So I think what we'll do is we'll hit this trough uh, for a period of time as everybody's kind of out of the office, not, not as much activity on that side then it will start to slowly pick back up because people aren't simply gonna rush back into the offices, turn back all the equipment right away. So I think that smoother U-shaped recovery is more likely here. And so Zach, do you, do you, uh, you know, we talk quite a bit about this U-shape and sound wave or whatever you wanna call it, but the fragmentation of the market. So you see the, uh, you know, the Federal Maritime Commission gathering, they've got like 50 some leaders now talking about supply chain and how to make it more efficient and collaboration uh, to, to make things better when we, or, or to operate better, a better response to these black swine events that are, that are not like hurricane, they, they come out of nowhere type of thing. But, uh, and, and there's also, uh, you know, possibilities of more blank sailings as, as the carriers try to avoid record, uh, you know, losses, uh, but also, uh, you know, trying to keep in, in mind that we need to keep uh, goods moving, right? We need to keep where there is that demand and those goods are needed to move. They need to keep moving and keep the economy moving as well as it can be. And I'm watching the exports 
or the imports into the United States from all around the world, and they continue to to rise. I mean, there, there's there's definitely bumps and and little troughs in there, but they're on a steady, pretty steady uptick uh, uptick for for many of the ports and for the U.S. Uh, in general. So a, as you see this U shape recovery in this trough. You still got to be watching for those different pockets and where there are those opportunities, right? Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I think that U-shape recovery we're watching on the import side is very, you know, you can apply that a lot to the uh, domestic freight market, uh, just because that's that's going to be more representative of the demand. A lot of that freight that's moving on those ships is retail uh, goods coming from China. Uh, and it hasn't come online all right away. You know, you see this kind of jagged, slow uptick in the import volumes. And again, like you said, that's going to be dependent on which industries start to come online. It's, you probably will see a surge of volumes in certain sectors, certain commodities. As people get back to work here in the near term, I don't think that we're going to see a full-on recovery on the imports uh, here in anytime soon just because we're seeing reduced demand. Uh, we've seen a lot of cancellations specific to the retail and apparel side. Uh, so again, it's not going to come all the way back uh, here in the near term. But you know, some of these industries and sectors that get going, especially in the food and beverage, we could see a dramatic shift in supply chain uh, as people are adapting to this new way of life. And coming out on the other end is probably going to look a little bit different than what it looked like on the front end of this. Zach, I agree. Very good points. Thank you so much for your time today. Mm -hmm. And to catch out more of Zach's uh, information, he's certainly on video and FreightWaves TV, uh, Freightonomics with our next guest, Anthony Smith, as well as the chart of the week every Saturday on FreightWaves.com. Uh, a couple comments here. Uh, one is from uh, Claudino Mungia. I think I have that right. <laughs> I have no idea, though. Uh, but what's your take on companies like FedEx Ground, where most of the operation is, most of the operation teams run, and, and thus we can't keep the the six feet in between us. However, we don't get a mask or gloves from them. Just have to be safer inside the truck, and in much of, in many of the hubs, nobody wears a mask or gloves, and and that they really aren't respecting social distancing. I, I, I haven't seen anything official that that, that is the case. Is if he's true. if he's reporting from inside one of those hubs, then that's an issue. I mean, yeah. we need to be practicing safe. We've we've talked about this, and you know, we had the issue in I think it was Staten Island, the M Amazon distribution center, right, where they mm -hmm. were uh, they wanted it shut down and cleansed because they had a, a positive case there. Uh, and I mean, we need to be practicing safe social yes. distancing and those masks and the gloves, et cetera. Uh, in, in all in all aspects, especially on those on those docks where you're moving and handling freight, and, and especially those those parcels, right? Uh, a lot of that is conveyed uh, and, and moved and electronically moved, but then you've got stackers inside those trucks uh, that are moving that are that are putting the you know stowing the cargo inside the inside those trucks and moving them. And you know there are specific OSHA standards already for eyewear and so on and so forth when you're driving a, a forklift. So let's get the masks and the gloves on and keep moving because it's essential to keep those people safe. If they can't operate safely and they get shut down, we're in trouble. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one more quick uh, comment from one of our viewers, and then we'll go to, to Anthony Smith. And this is from Brandon Paskowitz, and he's a, a basically assistant sales manager at XGuard Industries. And he has a good question. We, we don't really have the answer for it right here. Uh, but has there been an increase in insurance claims for freight companies during this freight way or the, this wave of freight? Or is the reduced traffic keeping drivers safer? And that, that data probably won't be out for uh, a little while, but it'll be very interesting to, to see. Uh, but right now, let's kick it over to our head economics person here at Freight Waves, Anthony Smith. And what do you have for us, Anthony? Kevin, um, a lot going on, of course, I think, as Andrew and, and, and Zach went over. And when we look at things on a macroeconomic level, since there's been so many changes throughout the month, it's almost like as soon as the data comes out, it's almost obsolete. And so that's why I'm really thankful that we have some of the truckload data sets there and sonar where it's near real time because it's like the first half of March even was completely different than the mid towards the end. I mean, one of the things Zach talked about was how 
we saw a rapid rise in rejection rates and now we're starting to see end volumes as well. Now we're starting to see that come back down. So really what I'm looking at is looking at comparing some of those uh, truckload data sets with some of the stories that we're seeing within the macro economy and really being able to forecast and set expectations accordingly. Um, we're looking at things on a macro level. So, Anthony, is, you, you know, as uh, trying to forecast in the economy, you need a lot of historic data, right? I mean, right. years of it in, in many, many cases to understand where, where it's going. Are you are getting any sense of how people are reacting and how industries are ap- reacting, I mean, in this very short time frame that is here that, that gives you any uh, better inkling or feeling on which way the economy is going or how, you know, how bad this trough is going to be that we're, we're diving into? Definitely, and I think so when we're looking at this, we have to look at the most refreshed data points. And so one that I think the one that's caught the most headlines, of course, is uh, weekly jobless claims, um, setting new records, unfortunately, on a week-to-week basis, released every Thursday, I think around 10 a.m. Um, and so I think over the last two weeks, we saw nearly 10 million uh, file for initial unemployment benefits. And so that's one of the, the areas that we have to kind of constantly monitor. Um, one of the areas that we are seeing, uh, the logistics manager index that has a component for uh, inventories and we're starting to see inventories build up a little bit. And so um, when we're kind of looking at so many, the surge in volumes um, from freight, um, it's kind of indicative of telling that story that there was a large pull forward, almost like the pull forward that we saw roughly a year ago when um, there were so many uncertainties around trade war and what was going on there. We saw a lot of businesses pulling inventory forward. We saw um, warehouses filling up quickly. Um, so I think we're going to start to see some of that similarly on the consumer side of things, especially as some of that spending kind of starts to curtail a little bit. Um, unfortunately, when we have uh, these initial jobless claims, that's really going to start to diminish the propensity to spend for a lot of consumers. And so when we see that start to really impact the consumer, they're going to, it's going to be, it's going to subside the, the um, overall propensity to spend and a lot of that discretionary spending. And that's going to really ease, I think, a lot of the panic buying, at, at least on, on the, in the coming weeks. Anthony, over the next couple of weeks, uh, what are some of the main economic data points that are coming out that you're really keeping an eye on? One that's kind of been flying under the radar that I'll be looking at, um, of course, housing related uh, indicators um, back at my roots here. Uh, Looking at housing just because it was one of the shining stars throughout the latter half of 2019 and going into 2020, um, we saw construction spending really going up pretty high. We saw housing starts really coming online, new home sales. Inventory was really tight for existing home sales. Um, We have a few areas that might get a boost when we're looking at uh, infrastructure spending. I saw an idea floated about pulling that forward and that could potentially really um, add to some more freight volumes potentially. Of course, I'm always keeping my eye on consumer sentiment as uh, Zach Strickland knows very well. Um, When I'm looking at consumer sentiment, that's also gonna play into, even on the recovery side of this, how quickly and how fast we can bounce back because even if um, employment levels start to come back, spending starts to come back online only if consumers are feeling confident enough to do so. Excellent. Anthony, I wanted to go back real quick uh, before uh, Kevin's question to you was uh, you were talking about inventory levels seem to be uh, or there's indications that they're starting to come up a little bit. And so when I was talking to Zach and as we're looking at the different, uh, you know, the different data sets within Sonar and and looking what's coming online and and import levels uh, and and the different ports. So import levels are continuing to come back up. There's a steady increase there. So if inventory levels, uh, I mean, imports. And so if inventory levels are coming up. As far as the trucking uh, economy, the, the, the surface, the over the road truckload, we would expect then to see that initial or a recovery in the short haul prior to the long haul as those inventories uh, grow? Or do you see it still bypassing those initial inventories as they enter the United States, those initial warehouses and getting directly to the DCs? Right, so Vince, I think you're spot on, especially with the short haul aspect of it all. Um, Of course, when we had a lot of those uh, panic buying, pulling a lot of that stuff forward, we just saw a lot of that just bypassing it completely. I think in the the interim, we're gonna see some of that uh, ramp up in the short haul, um, especially as we see more and more goods come in on the import side. Also, that import side is really kind of showing that um, some of the countries like China, where this was all really ground zero, starting to come back online, I think many have seen that 
as somewhat of a, a sign of hope that if uh, the nation where all this started is starting to come back online, that there is an end in sight somewhere um, as we move forward throughout all this. But I think when we are starting to look at uh, inventory levels starting to build up, I think we're definitely going to see a lot more um, short haul volumes or activity ramping up in the near term. Um, but definitely, I think uh, we're going to have to monitor those inventory levels as um, those supplier deliveries really got pulled forward so much throughout the month. Um, I don't think the same uh, volume is going to be necessary as we get into April and May and, and, and really well into the summer. Do you think I w we have a, a viewer uh, question for you, and I think you might have answered a little bit there, but Clay Longworth with um, Direct Traffic Solutions has this question. When does this start to come back? Do you think there will be an overwhelming surge? And if so, how will that best be managed? So uh, you, you might not have the timing down, uh, but once, you know, what kind of surge could we expect, if, if any, uh, when we come back online? Right, so I think when we're looking at recovery, um, because so first, going into this whole thing, we had um, a pretty substantial uh, stimulus package, right? And so that's really kind of something to hold a lot of the U.S. economy over. We had the shuttering of all these non-essential businesses. When we start to look at recovery, we're going to start to see, okay, where is the emphasis going to be placed on uh, businesses coming back online? And where are these regions going to be on place where we start to see states kind of coming back online, popping up one by one? And so I think when we're looking at that recovery, um, I think we're definitely going to start to see some activity ramping up towards the latter half of 2020, of course. Um, I'm, I'm thinking more along the, the August uh, and after time frame where we're starting to get into um, starting to see some significant steady increases um, that will be meaningful and substantial over, overall. Um, but I think when we're looking at uh, moving forward, um, we're not going to get into, I don't think, any kind of full on back to where we were recovery until we're into 2021. Um, but I think a lot of that's going to depend on uh, what kind of incentives are going to be set in place um, by, by, the, the, by Congress, by the government, to really kind of influence and really kind of push consumers and certain businesses forward because um, small businesses are getting hit hard. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see if there's going to be some kind of emphasis to, end, uh, to kind of really influence and kind of really um, push them forward to really start to kickstart things again and, and really kind of uh, set them in a um, set their ease, uh, ease their worries a little bit. Thank you so much, Anthony Smith. You can catch Anthony and Zach every Wednesday at, I believe, 2 p.m. Eastern time on Freightonomics on FreightWaves TV. So thank you again, Anthony. And from here, we will cut over to Trent Broberg, who's a COO of truckstop.com. And there you That's are, Trent. Cool. That's uh, very good. Coming through loud and clear. How are you doing out? Let's turn down the volume just a little bit. Okay, we're good. Uh, how's everything going on on your end? You had some big announcements this week uh, for truckstop.com and for Sonar as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Really in an effort to, to help the industry, you know, as we're all going through some challenging times here, we kind of, uh, as a leadership team, got together and, and pulled uh, a lot of our, our fantastic partners like uh, freight waves and the sonar platform and some others out there together to try to help the industry forward. So we we put together an offering that is providing you know a month free to to the industry uh, to those non-current customers out there to try to help them find freight as we start seeing some of the freight trends and the load volumes decrease across the industry. So trying to help them in in various different ways and then partnering with uh, the sonar platform to offer to every one of our customers to try to find intelligence and understanding of what the industry is doing and what the forecast looks like uh, going forward. Fantastic. Thanks very much, yeah. Brent. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that's great stuff. So um, what are you seeing in, in the market? What's, what's your view of, of what's going on now with the, the, the downturn and volumes kind of dropping off? What are you seeing across the, across the board? Yeah, it was interesting. We had a, a pretty exciting March. Uh, if we just look at freight volumes in general, regardless of what the macroeconomic industry is doing, uh, freight volumes were really up in March, April. Um, they've started to trail off a little bit, as, you, as everybody kind of suspected there'd be this 
this rate and freight cliff that's that's uh, slowing as manufacturing. That bull bullwhip effect kind of came down the pipe with manufacturing, whether it be domestic or international. And you know, over the last few weeks, um, particularly last week, we've really seen some of the volumes uh, across the industry decreasing. So um, I think obviously the hoarding, uh, the the toilet paper and so forth, is has kind of gone by the wayside and. And uh, we're at a, a new normal here for the next, hopefully, uh, just a few weeks until we can get back out there and, and get back into the retail and consumer segments. Hey, uh, Trent, uh, this is Kevin. Yeah. So, so basically, looking across uh, the, the platform between Van and, and Reefer and, and Flatbed, are you seeing any significant trends on, on the load board right now? Yeah, obviously, Reefer, if we go back uh, a few weeks, Reefer was, uh, you know, as we were going all out uh, grocery shop shopping and, and quote unquote hoarding a little bit. Um, obviously, the, the the van and Reefer did uh, very well over the, the last month or so. Uh, flatbed slowed down just a little bit, but was still trending higher than, than both of those segments. Um, I think just generally speaking, um, when you look at the percent Deltas, uh, they're all pretty much down the same. Um, you know, manufacturing is slowed, so obviously that kind of hits the pipeline across um, all of those segments and modes. Yeah, Trent, this is Mike Vincent here. Um, so, you know, we're we're seeing that slowdown uh, across the board in, in in you know across the United States and in, in most every industry. But some of those industries right. are are repurposing themselves, right? Uh, uh, who is it? Cummings is now repurposing some of their materials for for masks now, and General Motors is making uh, different uh, devices, and so is 3M, and et cetera, et cetera. But as this turns down, there's different opportunities that are out there, right? And so, um, you know, what truckstop.com is doing is you, you're providing that visibility and hooking up carriers or, or truckers with, with where their next load is and where they can get those loads that are, that are paying well, et cetera, right? So that, that's what you're doing in real time, letting them know where those, those new loads are. And so this coupling that with the data that you're getting out of out of sonar this kind of this free use of sonar with the truckstop.com seems like now you've got it just you've got the best of both worlds if you're a trucker out there because this is fragmenting the recovery is fragmenting and even though things are down there are still loads out there and there are still markets out there that have tender rejections where you've got to find capacity correct that's right yeah um you know, there's some interesting trends going on in the industry. A lot of people are repurposing across the board. So it'll be interesting to see the shifts there and what that does from the freight industry. Um, when you look at, you know, what Truck Stop is kind of, uh, what we have built over the years, the past 25 years is really a connectivity platform. You know, in times like this, where carriers are struggling to find loads potentially, uh, I've heard carriers just having a lot of problems finding loads, finding uh, well-paying loads and finding loads that fit their network profiles. So that's kind of our impotence to provide this free service to the industry to try to continue to connect people. As the brokers are searching for carriers or trying to co procure capacity, they can also go onto our platform for free, those that aren't current customers, and jump on and, and utilize uh, that connectivity platform. And then when you look at uh, some of that planning and understanding of how you're balancing your networks and understanding where your capacity buys are and and what your freight, like you, like you mentioned, your tender rejects should be or shouldn't be, um, taking that platform on sonar and, and piling it on top of that spot market really gives you that full visibility on on not just today and your transactional volume, but also tomorrow and into the future. Yeah, excellent. So, I mean, you can look at those trends and see where there's a an emerging market like imports. You're looking at the imports that are coming in, and you can tell whether the, the short haul is going to grow in that market or look at the outbound tender volume trends and inbound tender volume trends and see, okay, in the next two, three days, this is going to be a hot market. And you can go through then a platform truckstop.com and look and say, okay, where are those shippers in that area and who do I need to connect with? Because this seems like it's going to be a hot market over here and kind of make that connection, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and the carriers, you know, we look at it, the carriers, uh, 
there's a couple different segments and carriers. You've got the fleets, which is kind of you're describing, which is their relationship with the brokerages mm-hmm. on our platform. And then you've got the owner operators. And really what we, what our charter is, is helping those small mid-side biz- businesses um, flourish. And those owner operators, even, even going into Sonar, can provide them with a ton of visibility with the tools that TruckStop has for supply and demand and Sonar to understand what that looks like into the future, to understand where they're repositioning, maybe their four trucks, or maybe their singular truck, uh, understanding where I need to land to get a better rate outbound, um, you know, a specific city. So understanding and planning and scheduling their, their business, whether you're one truck or your 20,000 trucks is critical uh, more than ever right now. Thanks so much, Trent. Um, so, so basically, to, to capitalize on a free month of Sonar, if you're a truckstop.com account holder, you can go to freightwaves.com or sonar.freightwaves.com. And if you, to capitalize on a free month of uh, truckstop.com, where do they go? Truckstop.com. We made it real difficult. Uh, that, that's uh, very good. Yeah. I like so that. Truckstop.com. <laughs> there's, a, there's a link, community.truckstop.com, that will provide you with all the – the other partners that we've we've made relationships and have uh, relationships with, you know, it's not just Sonar, but we try to bring best of breed together uh, and try to really help the industry. And if you're interested in partnering with us or obviously FreightWaves, uh, feel free to reach out to me or any one of the truck stop folks, and we can get you into that cycle as well. So let's let's help the industry move forward. Very good. Very well, good. thank you very much, Trent, and. Um... And good luck and and stay safe out there. Yeah, you too, Kevin. Thanks, guys. You bet. Thanks, Thank Trent. you. Take care. So, wow, it's good stuff. That, that's really good stuff, right? <laughs> so, you know, a f- free month of Sonar to all uh, yeah, well, truckstop.com, uh, Load Pro. Yeah, these guys that, 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 I mean, his main customer base are the guys that really need this help. I mean, everybody needs help, mm-hmm. right? But they need that visibility that because they don't they don't have those those relationships that the that the big guys do, right? <laughs> And That's so they exactly kind of right. need they need that that Find visibility, capacity. and he's given that ability for them to quickly, you know, hook up with with shippers and get those loads. Mm-hmm. But when you combine that then with Sonar knowing where those next hottest markets are, where there are pressures uh, on different capacity, and uh, so on and so forth, now you've you've really got yourself a powerful tool, right? You do. You with definitely the two together. do. Definitely do. It's awesome. So coming up next, we have uh, another interview. Speaking of big um, dogs, I think are they not online yet? So very good. So let's talk about freight forecasting, your show uh, at 4.30 okay. on Thursdays. And what are you going to uh, to be talking about this week, Michael? Yeah, so uh, really a lot of what, what Trent and I were talking about and, and what uh, uh, Zach uh, and I were talking about was, you know, it, it, Everybody keeps talking about it. it's it's dying, it's dying, it's dying, it's dying, right? Mm-hmm. The, the 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 freight freight market is dying. The the fact of the matter is is is, is that is true. The volumes volumes are dropping, but you can see these upticks and and these changes that that happen quite dramatically throughout the United States. And, and so there's plenty of opportunities out there for carriers and for and for intermediaries, uh, and there's plenty of hurdles for the shippers to be overcoming right now. Where capacity is still crunching because it's fragmenting and things are changing. I'm watching imports come in, and I'm watching them come across through through intermodal movement and hitting different markets and 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 uh, and, and affecting those local markets that will then affect inventory that will then affect the the long haul and the mid haul and the tweeners and and so on and so forth. And so th- this Thursday, what we're focusing on is. In a market that seems like everything's just going down, where do you find those next opportunities, or how do you avoid those hurdles? You, you know, it's not on a homogenous move through every single market. It is not, and a lot of the you know depends on demand, which is yeah. very murky right now. You know, we say this all the time: we're in a black swan event, and being able to piece that together is. is a lot of art it, it, uh, it, it over is. science, really, right now. It is. It, it, my my personal opinion is just that. You know, it, we got this U shape, a, a V shape. I think there'll be pockets of V shape recoveries, mm-hmm. and it all depends on how we react and how we recover from the actual virus itself. Not economically recover, but the the mental, the the psyche of 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 the American consumer and also manufacturers. When is that point where we're at and the numbers show, and it is socially acceptable and politically acceptable to say? All right, we, we got it. Let's get back to work and make things happen. 
right? Exactly right. It's all uh, it tied into <clears throat> customer sentiment, health yeah. sentiment, all of those things. And I think I, I said 4.30 on Thursday. It's 4 o'clock on it's Thursday. It's 4 o'clock, yeah. Sorry about that. It's 4 o'clock on Thursday. Coming up today, uh, we have Great Quarter Guys, which we taped yesterday. Awesome. Um, but we're talking about 8Ks, right? So it's, it's one of those SEC filings for public companies where there's material change. And as we've been saying, there's been material change everywhere where you're drawing down maybe uh, credit revolvers to, to have liquidity and cash to, to ride through the storm, to describe the storm that, that you're running through, or any other material changes to your business. So that's at, at 2 o'clock today. And then after that, from 3.30 to 5 o'clock, we have a, a, special, uh, a special broadcast from... Um, uh, TCA members, Chris Henry, um, part of the Profitability Partnership, and and basically about seven or eight other people on a panel. I'm not quite sure exactly how many people will be yeah. on the panel, uh, but for an hour and a half, they're going to talk about the CARES Act, which everyone should uh, be very very interested in, right? Yeah. What's in that $2 trillion stimulus package? Uh, what's in there for trucking? You know, there's there's all kinds of small business the loans two, out the there. The current $2 trillion one? Yeah, the current $2 trillion okay, one. There's a lot yeah. of small business loans that, that need to be addressed. And uh, that's a confusing water. I tried navigating it a little bit over the uh, weekend for Yeah, I did family myself, and, and I could and contradict myself. I could have an argument with myself with, with what some of the stuff I, I, I says. Know, right? Right? It's, it's very murky, very yeah. opaque. You so pick one side, I'll pick the other. I'll just I, flip I, you for the I, side. I, I know, right? right? So they're going to go into detail about the explanations. They're going to have a really great panel discussion. That'll be some really good all information. All online on FreightWaves TV, and that's at 3.30 Eastern time uh, to, to 5 o'clock today. Nice, nice, nice. Well, we got some time for some of We missed a couple of headlines we that we didn't time. get to because um, I spoke, I guess, a little too much on some things. But that's fine. Chris Gillis, so uh, the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission said there, uh, uh, there has uh, been no shortage of container shipping industry members willing to participate in its initiative to identify ways to overcome supply chain obstacles caused by the coronavirus pandemic. And that's what I was talking to, to Zach about a little mm -hmm. bit uh, a, a little earlier is this initiative. So the, uh, the commissioner has so far asked three questions of each of the team members. So what they're looking at, and they don't have any answers yet, so this is initial, they're just starting to do this, right, is is what can the FMC uh, do to provide relief or assistance to mitigate negative impacts on the supply chain related to COVID-19? Uh, a fairly obvious question. What can companies involved in ocean care uh, cargo delivery do to respond to existing supply chain challenges and bottlenecks? And what can supply chain participants do to strengthen the overall performance of the American freight delivery uh, system? And I, I think these are great things, and this could this could really help uh, you know move things forward and kind of have that stickiness of of some sort of silver lining on this black cloud that is coronavirus 19 and what it's doing to our economy and our, and our overall health. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so we have David Jackson on, on the phone now, and I think we're ready to go. David Jackson, president and CEO of Night Transportation, and I see him right there. How are you doing today, David? Hey, doing great. How are you guys? Uh, we're doing great as well. Doing, we're doing great, great, David. Thank you. Uh, and, and basically trying to stay safe in these these crazy times. Yep, we all are. Appreciate what you guys are doing. Very good. I appreciate what, what you guys are doing as well. Uh, how's everything going for you right now? Well, we're uh, we're navigating these times as best that we can. You know, we uh, we of course uh, are fortunate to be in an industry that has been able to largely operate without uh, major disruption. Now, there are new com new complexities that we deal with, but the reality is we have unbelievable drivers who continue to report for duty and do an unbelievable job, not only for us, but also for the country. And so uh, we're, we're fortunate there. And, you know, the freight landscape, I'm sure, will continue to change uh, in the in the coming weeks as things have slowed so dramatically in the economy. Uh, but uh, but we're doing well, so thanks for asking. Very good. And you guys uh, have decentralized or are basically working remotely, at least the, certainly the, the office staff. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and the nature of both Knight and Swift is we run decentralized operating models. So from an operations perspective, we're already 
We already do so and operate in a very decentralized across the country over about 70 locations. And so from our support, um, our main support centers here in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, those jobs are largely able to be done remotely. And so I'm in a largely vacant building as we speak. So uh, it's easier to be here right now than I have five children at home trying to learn through uh, Zoom and from college down to second grade. So this is actually the quietest place I can find right now. So, uh, but I really don't have to be in this office uh, as uh, we've been able to re work remotely. Now for our terminals, you know, we've got minimal staff there on site to support our drivers. Uh, typically we still need one or two, sometimes three at our larger facilities to support our people. And then of course our shop mechanics, technicians have been phenomenal and they, they're helping to keep things up and running and keep the maintenance flowing as it had before. That's good stuff. So, you know, um, we've seen uh, a lot of different reports on many different aspects of the business, David. And, and this is Mike Vincent here. Thank you for being on. Um, but but one of them has been, you know, the, the recruiting of drivers in the schools it's, uh, uh, and, and a potential shortage there. Are you seeing this as an issue or how are you guys dealing with that? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. I think, um, you know, it, it hits us a little bit differently uh, because we are able to do the training over the road. Uh, there's definitely been a pickup, it seems like, in phone calls of folks that are interested in, uh, in, in getting a job and viable employment as, uh, as it's been more elusive here in the economy as of late and maybe people are anticipating what's to come. The, the reality is training drivers in this environment can be very tricky. If you think about it, we need uh, typically four weeks over the road with them. Well, the next four weeks are probably uh, very hard to predict, um, just given where the world is. And so uh, we have seen uh, good opportunities with experienced drivers that are looking for safe places to, to drive for uh, large freight networks, uh, which, which I think we would uh, certainly fit the bill there. We're the largest. And so uh, I, I don't know if that's, we would consider that a flight to quality or a flight to safety for experienced drivers, but we definitely have seen a pickup there. So I, I suspect that we will see the driver schools and many of the training programs slow dramatically here over the next couple, two, three months. Uh, but boy, on the other side of this thing, I think that will be a very hot area. If you think about unemployment coming into this at call it 4.3% two or three weeks ago, to uh, to a number that will be uh, 50 to 100 percent that size most likely at some point through this process, um, you know, and a little higher unemployment typically bodes really well for the training, for the schools and for the training programs. And our through our academies, we have capacity, and in in strong years, we've done as many as 14, 15,000 drivers have been trained through our programs, uh, mainly on the Swift side. So, uh, but now is probably not the ideal time for that. But that that time will be coming. Very good, David. Uh, so, so with all the um, talk about sanitation, washing your hands, you know, social distancing, how are you guys sanitizing your trucks and equipments and, and locations? Yeah. Well, we. We certainly wipe down surfaces with uh, with with things that will kill bacteria uh, inside the truck when we uh, when we transition the driver. Obviously, we put a new mattress in as well, but we'll wipe down surfaces. We have a process. We use a device uh, that's uh, an ozone device that we'll uh, also use to treat the trucks. And uh, we're so we're exceptionally careful when we put a mechanic into a truck and they're wearing gloves. Plus we wipe things down. So that's that's more on the sanitation side, I would say. In, in terms of keeping our drivers safe, uh, we've sourced 80 full truckloads of provisions between water and food and including some hand sanitizer as well. We have some masks uh, that uh, we'll make available for our drivers. And so we've been trying to source things to make life a little bit easier to facilitate our drivers continuing to to, uh, to move on the road uninterrupted and really without going in harm's way and not having to wait in lines at grocery stores or be uh, be amongst the crowds. And so, you know, that doesn't satisfy all of their needs, of course, but it's just one little thing we've been doing over the last couple of weeks to try and help facilitate and ease that. And then, of course, we encourage, uh, you know, appropriate social distancing for our drivers. Uh, we're fortunate to have such a large physical facility network of 70 locations. so. 
uh, you know, we're able to control the kind of cleanliness of the bathrooms and the showers in our facilities just to try and keep everybody safe. Excellent. Thank you, David. So one of the questions, this is Mike again. Uh, so one of the things that we've we've talked about on several of different shows is is the driver recognition and kind of this this newfound, hey, we appreciate drivers. Uh, uh, and will that newfound appreciation and respect for what the drivers do, what the trucking community does, will that stick? What are you hearing out there from from your drivers and, and what are your thoughts on that? Gosh, hasn't that been great? I mean, that... It really has. Look, yeah, when we look for some of the positives to come out of what has been a very difficult situation, I think uh, there's a few things that stand out. Uh, to me, the biggest by far is the fact that uh, the hardest working employees of any industry have time and time again been over-the-road truck drivers. Amen. And, and they, they, they quietly go out without a whole lot of uh, desire for attention, and they make our economies flow. I mean, if it weren't for this unbelievable network of highways that Eisenhower built to connect military bases, that, uh, and then you look at 1980 deregulating trucking and opening it up so that businesses could affordably move their products throughout the whole country, and then a couple of million people willing to learn a skill that is very that is very scarce to be able to drive a truck back a truck in in the safe way that it has to be done on our congested highways uh, and then now to day in day out go out work hard drive over the road be away from family and friends sleep in their truck shower in truck stops that is that's unbelievable service that they provide that is so overdue to be recognized and so uh, so i'm grateful for that i can't i can't overstate that enough now it's been good for our people to recognize and feel this we have we have tried hard to recognize our drivers and, and key milestones that they accomplish along the way and i think this will help us and help our people uh, to even get better at how we view and appreciate each one of our drivers individually. And so I think that's been huge. I think another silver lining for what it's worth is is we've been able to have a workforce that has, has been able to transition, overcome the distractions or any challenges without being that, that come with not being right next to the people you work with in a very transactionally intensive business. And we've been able to continue to execute the business with high levels of service, high levels of communication. And so, boy, it says a lot about our people. And it's not just our company, this whole industry. Things are moving and working together, both in our customers, with our competitors, uh, to uh, to do so remotely and in a way that uh, that really shows personal accountability. So there's there's a lot of silver lining in this industry from what we've seen over the last month. Excellent. Thank yeah, you, David. Excellent. Thank you, David. Yeah, a lot of silver linings, as we call the, the drivers around here, always responders. Uh, you know, very, it was great speaking with you. And, um, you know, I wish you guys well. And, you know, safety first, definitely. Thanks, guys. A pleasure. Take care. Thanks, David. Thank All the best. Thank you. So, it's been a yeah, lots of been, good stuff. Gr great show, a, a really great show th today. Uh, basically, going in and talking news, economics, great free offers and special offers by Truck Stop and and Freightwave Sonar. Yeah, and check that out. If you're a driver great. out there, a carrier out there, you need yeah. to check out that that deal. That is a really good deal to be able to get hooked up with loads and also see all those different uh, markets that are out there. And then a great interview from from David at, at, at Night Swift. So yeah, it's, great it's been really good. You. Just wanted to remind everyone at 3.30 today, 3.30 to 5, the TCA is doing a town hall about the CARES Act. So basically all the questions you have about the CARES Act, uh, please tune in. They'll be going over that. I believe they're going to be taking live questions as well through LinkedIn or, or YouTube or wherever we're broadcasting live. So you can ask them your questions and, um, and get some clarification on that massive $2 trillion bill that is very difficult to understand. <laughs> yeah, to say, right? the, to, to say, to the, say least. the least. Yeah, <laughs> to say the least. And I wanted to ask David. When he, he said they were training in the cab and they can do that over the road. I wanted to ask him that question because that, that relief bill for the, for the schools was that the CDL driver 
doesn't need to be in the seat next to them. So how are, how are they oh, dealing yeah, with right. that? But yeah, that's a, that's a, a technical uh, trickery too, right? It's just you know, something how, that's stuck in my brain. How know, are they right? doing that? You know, what does that really look out like? <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> how does that actually function? <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so thank you guys all, all very much for tuning so, in. Uh, one last thing, oh. just one last thing. Do I have enough time for one last thing? You so, do, yes. Yes, the closing point, one of the big fundraisers for the St. Christopher Truckers Relief Fund is the Mid-American Truck Show. The cancellation of that show this year will cut into the funding and awareness of the fund, which helps truck drivers financing, uh, facing financial challenges due to illness or injury. So in 2019, Kevin, the fund distributed 487000 almost a half a million dollars to 344 truckers and their families. Okay, That's and awesome. So the Mid-American Truck Show is their main fundraising mm-hmm. event. Didn't happen. Not happening for them. So please go to truckersfund.org and contribute and help out the St. Christopher Trucking Relief Fund. And, and I think C.H. Robinson did a, a big donation. It's on FreightWaves.com, that right. story. But uh, we're over time right now, so thank you so much for joining us. And we'll be back n- Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern with another coronavirus freight market update.